Work, based in Rome in Disney Cast, Key Screen in Bonji. Um, so I'm from, I'm from uh, Key Screen and uh, I'm also a graduate student at University of Manitoba, but really I'm a student of the language and that's what uh, this, this talk will be uh, for today. Um, so, Sasquatch, the first treaty, how I came about, about this story, uh, in Shakamu, I go. We tell them go to the mind. Sasquatch the first tree. So just to, to a little uh, preview, we're gonna be here today. So we all know a little bit about the number of trees and how they're the foundation of what Canada was built on. If it, if it wasn't for those number of trees, we'd be probably the Americans right now. But uh, the Royal Proclamation, the Treaty of Niagara, the Robinson Hero Treaty. Tree, and the number of trees 1 to 11 are all uh, the, the foundation of uh, that Canada is built on. But uh, long ago, there was a first treaty that was an agreement that was made between the Man Quake, Sky Woman, and Time Animal Worlds. And we'll, we'll go into the conclusion too. So, how this how this uh, first treaty came about is my, my dad actually encouraged me to uh, explore what do these words mean, Inakon Gaelan. Inakon Gaelan is, is, uh, is referenced, you know, when in the pipe directions, you don't see the pipe here, you actually might be in the, in the lower corner. But the pipe is symbolic of those four, uh, those four um, layers of natural laws we're talking about, spirit laws, the water, there's, um, Time for all, there's trees, there's, there's uh, earth laws, there's rocks, and then there's human laws, lots of laws. Uh, and uh, so, like I said, this, these come from um, David Teaching Lodge. Uh, scrolls, scrolls are similar to those, but uh, they've always been meant to be replicated, and we hear them repeatedly over and over at uh, the Teaching Lodge at different times of the year. We'll hear them again, and uh, March in the March, the purpose and intent of these stories. So this this uh, creation story, we're connecting it. We're trying to connect it more to the curriculum now. So you know, um, when we think about uh, creation stories and songs, we think of like lunar calendars. What came first, the songs and the stories, or did the or did, or did the lunar calendar come first? So I mean, they're intertwined, they likely developed in unison. Okay, so question stories are not whimsical stories either. They do, they do not include modern scientific explanations of how the world began because they're ancient, but they express the deepest, truest, enduring values, hopes, and fears, and beliefs of the traditional culture of the people. So, creation stories, they, they help with some of the most fundamental questions of human existence. Who made the sun, the moon, the stars? Where did people come from? Um, how did the animals, the birds, fish, and the plants begin? Creation stories are, they provide important information about culture, life, values, people, animals, environment. Stories are passed down orally from generation to generation through storytelling is the primary method of that. Uh, and, and of course, you know, today, you know, we're, we're in, we, we would have heard on schools today, we hear on smart boards today, from the rock walls to the Facebook walls, even. Uh, in First Nation traditions, they illustrate the interrelationships between all things in creation. So this one, we shot the Sasquatch, the first treaty. This is the part where I'm gonna, I don't know the story word for word, so I'm gonna share it to you, share it to you how we're developing it and uh, working on publishing it. <coughs> so Meng Wenzha, long ago, there was water here on earth, a salty water that had, already be, that had already been brought to this planet. That water came in the form of ice. An interaction happened between the ice and the Ishkade 
Your mouth might have been like the magma, the lava, the volcanoes, and the earth was a place of fire. That was that was the earth's surface at the time. This interaction happened because that else ice held on to Shinataw again salt. And it was able to calm the surface of the, of the earth. The magma and lava was spread all over the earth, all over the earth. And through that interaction, a new gas was created in the air. The atmosphere began to evolve and develop around the earth. The atmosphere formed a protection on the earth that we call the ozone layer. And it was during that period on earth that the first life emerged. The beautiful water laying on the earth had come from the ice and began to do its work. It started to generate itself. The water started to go up into the sky and come back down as rain. A cycle of going up and coming down started that clash, the Wawa KC, electricity, lightning. And it was through that clash or that action that life began in the ocean waters. It was because of that water and that lightning that was given the very first single cell in the, in the cell of the oceans. That single cell was created, was a, micro, was a microorganism. Atal Gib, or algae. But algae became Guinea Big, Guinea Big Bug fern. And the fern eventually became all the plants that we see, all the trees, all the berries, all the plants that we use for clothing, for food, for medicine, for shelter. They all exist because of those algae. It was that first cell, Atal Gib, and that first plant, Guinea Big Bug, that gave life to every single plant that you can think of today. <coughs> So every single leaf, vegetable, berry exists because of that atoll gym and gonna be bug. Those first plants transform themselves into things that would become useful to all of their life. Those things that are strong from the earth that we call medicine, must be key, like the nutrients from the food that come from all these different plants. That single cell organism in the ocean gave birth to crustaceans and the igloo look fish. And after a while, those fish down in the water habitat became curious. They wanted to know what was up there, up past that layer of water. And it was because of their curiosity that the fish were able to evolve themselves and approach the water's surface and then the land. Finally, they were able to come right out of the water. And all these things we call fish emerged, emerged from the water onto the land. Their curiosity got them to travel onto the land where they continued to evolve. So life in the world evolved from that single cell organism into the fish and all the birds and all the creatures on earth. We too are evolving humans. We too are at a point in our history where we're searching past that ozone layer, just like our relatives, the fish. We want to know what was beyond the surface of that water. Those fish knew there was more to the world. They knew that there was a world, there was an existence far beyond what they could see. And we humans know that there's a there's an existence beyond what we can see, imagine, or even comprehend. It is so amazing to think about that this earth was made up of all these particles from the Nungo Kwan, the star world. Think about all those particles coming together and forming different elements which created all the living forms on earth. It's such an amazing thought. It helps us to truly understand, to gain a better sense of why we call ourselves a mission of them, in the or whatever term in our, we use in our language to identify as humans. When you break that word down, Ishnabe, which means humans or people, the root of that word comes from when you lower from above, Ani, Ishnabe, the male. Ani, coming from, Ishnabe, lowered, Abe, the male of the species. All these terms for humans reference the sky and stars, or that humans were lowered from the heavens to this world. At some time during the evolution of Earth, Minaniko, the Sky Woman, came to this planet to check on how life was progressing. As she came to this area in the Nungo Kwan, in the Star World, she saw how beautiful this world was. After, after having seen the different solar systems and the different planets, she now saw how beautiful this world was. After having seen the different solar systems and the different planets, she now saw how truly beautiful this world was. And in that beauty, she saw the differences between this planet and all the other planets she had seen. How beautiful this place was compared to other places she had been before. She was in total awe. Her thinking was disturbed because of how beautiful this planet was. She could not comprehend how a place like this existed. 
So the Nanakwe Sky Woman had been invited to this earth to be part of a big celebration. They were going to be a they were going to have a celebration of the bounty of the earth. That event would, would include a the coming golden uh, a feast, a big sacred feast. And we still gather today and, and sing and commemorate on that. And commemorate and sing in commemoration of that first feast. And that first feast is where that is where all our modern, modern celebrations come from. We become a go. We were being invited to celebrate what nutrients we have gathered. Inanikwe was happy to, to be invited to, to come here to Earth at that time. So when Inanikwe Sky Woman arrived here, she did not want to disturb anything. She was so careful not to break any bread of grass, twigs, or trees. That's how much she loved this place just by observing it. She was so afraid, not because it was a new place, but, but because she was afraid she would destroy it. What if I touch it? I might kill it. She already had it in her mind that this earth was so delicate that it should be taken care of in the best way possible. It should not be destroyed. So before she stepped onto this wheel, she called out, she spoke to the trees and the plants. She spoke to the gardens and the plant world and told them, I wish to bring life here to my people. We need a place. We need a place to live. I'm looking for a place for my people. And for a long time, there was no response back. The Nani Kwe Sky Woman even spoke to the animals and reptiles that were present. Those animals that were, that were in this planet's early stage of life. She spoke to them and they didn't respond either. The animals and reptiles had already foreseen this being, this star woman who came from the heavens from the sky. They had been expecting this being who would be so beautiful and generous, yet very envious and destructive. And they were wary of her. They did not want to trust her in any, in any form. The animals and the reptiles, the reptiles knew Ninonikwe would have a devastating impact on this world. But a few animals saw past what the other animals and reptiles were seeing. There are a few animals around the world that looked beyond all that suspicion. And those few that saw there would be a time that Ninonikwe's people and the future Anishinaabe, the future star people, we need a place here, we need to be here in this world. They, need, they would be needed here to correct what's going to happen to the earth in the future, to correct and fix the disturbance that, that modern humans go through. They saw that the earth would become a place where humans could learn, like a living library, a living classroom. And those few animals saw how humans would need to conduct themselves and how they should treat the environment. They saw how humans would learn. They saw how humans would learn how to properly interact with one another, and the plants and animals around them. And those animals, the, the, those animals spoke up to say that the animal world, animal world, should always love the Anishinaabe, the star people. We the we the animals, we love the Anishinaabe so much. We will even help them. We will help them become their clan animals, their spirit animals. We will even tell them and warn them of danger ahead. We will even love them enough to warn them there is hardship ahead in their life. That is how much the animals and the reptiles loved us, those few animals around the world at that time. They wanted humans to experience this beauty, this world, this life. And it took them a long time to respond to Ninonikwe, Sky Woman. So it was the plant world that responded to Ninonikwe first. It was the plant world that said, Yes, we hear you. We hear you speaking to us. But you must also learn how to live any eva of which you came in. Carefully watch and observe. Serve sort of witness to what happens in this world. So the plant world told me, Nani Kwe, Sky Woman, that humans will have to pay attention to them. Pay attention to the plant world. Listen to them. Carefully watch them. Serve sort of witness. Understand that the Bakonagewan laws, the plants will help humans. The same thing happened with the animal world with Nanikwe Sky Woman. The animal world had their own Debakonigewan laws and Onakonigewan principles and policies. We, the Anishinaabe, would have to follow these laws in order, in order for us to survive here on this planet. We would have to commit. We would have to commit to an agreement between us humans, a foreign species and all life on this planet to uphold those laws. The agreement between us and the whole world was the first treaty that the animal and plant world gave us. 
the treaty was an agreement that we would follow the sets of rules according to what was being given to us on this planet. And those life forms in this world said that we humans would be a pitiful species. We would be a pitiful, we would be pitiful living here on this planet. They said that there would be a that we would also be a disturbed, disturbing and destructive force for ourselves, our neighboring camps, our nations, and to the environment. These are the things that the animals were worried about. But some of the animals saw more to the humans than just being a destructive force. Those, you know, those, those few animals would make sure that humans would uphold those laws. Those anim the animals would make sure that in the future, humans would still know about the laws. And they called the win, ne nakun geonan, high and repeatedly linked over and over is that word. The animals would make sure the laws would be tied and linked repeatedly and handed down to children over and over again. That these ha this had to be done so that future generations would benefit from these laws. And the plant world responded, and when the plant world responded, so did the animal world. They responded to the ionic way too. So I want to share with you two songs with you at this point in the story. The first song comes from the plant world, and that song acknowledges that the plant world heard Inani Quays, please, they're a home for her people. And the plants are singing, I hear her speaking to me. And the second song is the animal world's response to Inani Quay. The animal world is singing, I hear the plant world talking to her. We will also periodically watch the behaviors of these humans. We too shall, su su shall support this human life that she brings. So this is the first song from the plant world. <laughs> She was given permission to bring the rest of her people down from the heavens to this world. And at this point, her, her people were not in the form of, of an Anishinaabe. 
the Anikwe's people were, came in the form of Misabewa, giants. So that's an old word for giant, Misabe. They were, they were giant grandmothers and grandfathers, and there were 18 of those Misabewa, giants in total, both men and women. These giant grandmothers and grandfathers were interested to learn about the science and the, of, of the environment here on Earth. They were interested to learn from the nature of science. They needed to learn all about all these things in order for them to truly understand and appreciate what was being given to them in this world. Now, what was being given from the Masabe world was an opportunity to experience this world in a good way, one chance at life on Earth. And as these Masabe world giants roamed the Earth, they became known as Earth Keepers. The Masabe world were, they were attracted to certain parts of this planet. They became the guardians of these places. They made sure that they learn about the earth and science, sets of rules and laws and the teachings that were given to them in their learning experiences. All that knowledge would be kept safely, that knowledge would be kept safe and ready, readily available for people that would come in the future. The Masabe will keep all that knowledge to share with future generations so that people in the future would know how to survive here on the earth. Those future people would know how to function properly with the knowledge of the earth and to achieve their most elite stage of evolution as best as they could. And it happened that the giants, the grandfathers and grandmothers, and Sabe had to leave this planet. But before they left, other huge beings were entrusted to watch over the land. These other beings were also called to live in this new place, this world. They were called here to watch over the humans and make sure that they would always remember the first tree. These other huge beings were known as Mishapanua, Bigfoot, Sasquatches. And they were given the authority by the Masabu of giants to be the caretakers of the land and the earth. And as part of that agreement between Masabe and Mishapanua, the giants and Sasquatches, the Sasquatches says, we don't want to expose ourselves. He also said that there would be a time when the Mishapanua would, would come to be seen more and more by the humans. And these Bigfoot sightings would mean that the Earth will have become a very dangerous place to live. So Sasquatch is warned, the humans in the future do not want to see us. It will be a horrible time when we start to come out of the forest and interact with humans. The Mishapanua were afraid of that too, those Sasquatches. Same with those Misabewa, the giants. So the, Misha, so the Misabewa, the giants, were taken off the Earth. But they, but they left the Sasquatches on the surface of the world to oversee the humans and the humans' commitment to that first treaty. The Misabe of giants were not far from us here on Earth, these giant grandfathers and grandmothers. They were told by the plants and the animals, in order for the Nanikwe Skywoman to bring life here, you giants, Misabe must watch over this place too. You are responsible for bringing life here. We are not going to be, be the creators of the life. You are. All we can do is be, is be the creation of what they will need to survive here. Respect us, respect everything in this world, then you and your people will survive. So these Masada were giants who were taken and given a place to live on the dark side of the moon. There they were given the surety that they would have a, they would live for a long time. They were given the Manitou Ganaim, a ceremonial place, or a Mede Ganaim, a lodge. And there are 18 of those grandfathers and grandmothers. And of course, there were 16 giant grandfathers, giant, giants. But there were two more that were added to that lodge, one being Anna Bajou, and the other being Bobby Bonique, flower girl, Anna Bajou's younger sister. So there are, these are the 18 giant beings that sit in that moon who are entrusted to watch us humans from afar. And they are not, they are not allowed to go back to where they came from yet. They could not go back to their home until the whole transition of human existence is complete before they understood. It is still in that lodge on the moon where they sit. It is in that lodge in the dark side of the moon that they still watch us. So during that whole time, the Anikwe, Sky Woman, and those Musabe of giants had been learning about everything here on Earth. They were being taught how to live in this world, the animals, the bulls in particular, helped the giants name everything on Earth. They named all the trees, the plants, rocks, minerals within the rocks, all the different ice, the different waters, all the different atmospheres. 
Those wolves taught them the Sabu, the giants, everything about the science of nature. And later on, it was the wolves who played a significant role in the development of human life. But for now, that lady spirit, Nanikwe, said, Now that we have learned that all we possibly can, I wish to bring human life here. So, so Nanikwe attempted to bring several, bring humans here several times, 90 different times to be exact. And within those 90 different attempts, there were different stocks of humanoid beings on this planet. And about 200,000 years ago, there were only three types of humanoids left who had sur survived. So, in a, in a big span of time here, talking about three billion years ago, when the Nanaikwe first came to this planet, just 200,000 years ago, during that time, Nanaikwe periodically came to check on this world and the planet and the humanoids. That's how old she is, Nanaikwe, that beautiful spirit woman. So when the Nanaikwe came here, it was 200,000 years ago, on one of those trips, this is when she finally gave birth to quadruplets. She used those three bloodlines of humanoids that had survived to make human quadruplets. And those quadruplets are where we humans all come from. One of the quadruplets was Nana Baju. And it's because of him we are all alive. <clears throat> we all we all come from uh, Nana Baju. Human lies because of Nana Baju's mom. It was his mother that Saint that very same Vijay Manitou, Star Woman, who first came to the earth billions of years ago to ask the plant animal worlds if she could bring her giant people here. She she had asked. Can you, the plant and animal worlds, be ready for my people? That is what she had been asking. Could all the plants and animals that, that she spoke to be ready to support the giants? Could all the plants and animals offer themselves to the Nisabe for food, nutrition, clothing, shelter, and medicine for healing? That is how long ago that her voice was first heard on earth, that echo in her voice has made it through all the time. That echo of her voice is still here today. It is, in, it is in all the food we eat. No matter where we get it from, whether it's GMO or, or not, it does not matter where it's from. There's a still a little bit of that echo in the Nanikwe's voice left in all our food. And it's how we use that food, we incorporate that food with the Nanikwe's echo into our bodies. So back in ancient times, after particles from the Anango, Anango upon the star world had come and formed all the different elements that in turn created all the living forms on Earth, the Nanikwe arrived. And after getting permission to plant and animal worlds, after making the first tree, she brought the Masabe Wok here. And the Masabe Wok learned those sets of rules and laws from the plant and animal worlds, how to live here on Earth. And at that time, other huge beings, the Mishokmo, the Bigfoots, were also called here. When the, when the giants had to leave, and but they gave that, they gave the Mishokmo the authority to watch over the humans and guard that first tree. The Mishokmo, the Mishokmo, Zakos, have passed all over the world. <coughs> they become, became known as earth keepers. And they continue to watch over humankind to make sure they are following the first tree that was made between the Nanakwe and the plant and animal worlds. So, so that's a short creation story. Uh, and and it, it's, you know, that I've, I've heard explained in much more detail, but we want to uh, make it in a short form for our students. But the main theme of these cultures' big story is that the, the original structure is given to all things. Human Humankind was given their own atzoplana, original structures, and ownership of the natural laws. Throughout human history, throughout history, humankind has not always followed those original instructions. Consequences are often what you know, causes pain, hunger, disease, and all the other troubles we face as humans. But we face humankind. Some of that is pain. Ah, I'm losing my mojo. 
First six stories is for creation of big stories, like I was saying. I think because of creation story, to me, one first nation tells me God's vast information, your life, and the proper way to live on this earth. They tell of the purpose and role of every channel in creation, including humankind. They acknowledge the interconnections, therefore, their interdependence between all things in creation. So the big story of creation is told in many parts. So these stories that were shared today were from the hospital of Law Indian in Danu. He's a Nishnaabe from Charlotte, Ontario, and uh, one's cultural knowledge and gifts of transformed research strategies and all history documentation. And he has helped to circulate the builder known stories, such as Bagat, Van Spelten, that's a story about human loss, uh, Mishapin, Sasquatch, and Misabe, Giants. So these types of storytelling and research help to invigorate this understanding of law from an indigenous point of view and can foster in learners the beginning of a long-term relationship with the natural world based on reciprocity and rationality. So, and then he himself explained that what he carries is because of his mom, Shikshutu Kori, a Native woman, who is from Shore Lake, Ontario, where all our water comes from, actually. And it's been five years, more than that now, seven, that she left. But she always told me to keep keep doing this spiritual work. And his dad, like Bukhane, he just told his father, he's from Big Jackson. And I taught him about the big drum and how he was spirit to uh, be facing traumas in life. Spirit is part of science, medicine, culture, and language. So Jeremy already read this at the start, but that, that's uh, that's these stories are are, are part of a teaching launch. Uh, <clears throat> Medewin is uh, if you actually walk across the river over the bridge, you'll see that teaching lodge on the right. And just to help you understand what that word Medewin means, it's not not way away. It's talking about a, a pulse deep. And um, so it's a heart lodge. And uh, that red road that we talked about, you know, it, it, it's not talking about just a road for First Nation people. It's talking about um, blood. It's talking about human. We're all interconnected to that, that road. And uh, we often think of these stories that don't, don't, uh, they don't have that same space. Like when I went to Nashua, they have the coat of arms up on the wall. They got a unicorn. And they got a, a tiger in there, or a lion in there. But those those are based on mythology. So so where is that space for our own stories? Why is there not a Sasquatch up there? Why is there not a serpent up there? You know, a lot of our stories. Oh, by the way, today's actually serpent day. And I heard it on NCI. And they asked him, well, what did the serpent do? I said, you know what, this is the story. It doesn't talk about it, but there's, um, there, there, there are um, serpents that, uh, that are a big part of science, medicine. And in fact, you know, that rattle that we heard today, it's connected to, um, uh, that rattlesnake coming from the mountain was there, there's different snakes in the, in the larger creation story. But at one point, the, there's a rattlesnake that tightens around a deer and is telling it to hold on to these teachings. And, uh, and, and that's, that's a, a little piece in that story where, where I think about where that rattle comes from. And, um, but do you know what? We heard about Star World, that lodge is also up in the sky. It's connected to that Buffalo Giju. So that there's this, we're talking about an ice road up in the sky. And, uh, 
You know what? I didn't I didn't conclude that song with how it's supposed to end. The gate came out. You know? Uh, the gate came out. We're talking about otter's path. So what we're talking to you, what I'm talking to you guys about today is is um, as, as a as a spiritual language and a story that has survived and it's it's different than how we in Manitoba look at science. Because if we look at uh, what is the guiding star of, of science here in Manitoba, if we look at Monsanto, and we look at Manitoba Hydro, what of money becomes the guiding star. When, um, when you think about if we were to approach science differently from our own languages and stuff like that, you know, our, our languages are full of life. And we're, we're always thinking ahead of for future generations. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not of the thought that we're not smart enough to think our way out of this uh, uh, energy dependent economy that we're, we're all rooted in here. Because you know what? Even our own uh, culture, you know, this is, I'm part of our culture myself. You know, I have a car. Tim Hortons. I'm as I'm as uh, I, I use 200 plus liters of water a day, so I'm part of that problem too. But um, so I guess now is the time for questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? You were starting uh, to share a little bit about Serpent Day and the mm -hmm. story about Serpent. Um, was there more to it? Oh, yeah. Okay, kind of like just, uh, just kind of elaborate quickly for a minute if you can mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the name of that serpent, the way I hear it in the story, is called Mishandamu. Mishandamu should go a long way up. And I'm, I'm working on this two spirit story about uh, uh, Rainbow and, and the Serpent. And I, and I copied that. So the title from. Ray Davis, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, I like his work too. And uh, anyways, there's certain stories up here as well. And you know what, there's tons of them around Lake Winnipeg in all our communities. We always hear these stories. In fact, Hene Mutang talks about this huge skin that they, that they found and that they have this theory that there's, well, there's two known big pythons in, in uh, Amazon Python and African Python. They they connect and some some of these other people they, they think there's a third snake and, and that's up here and it hasn't been hasn't been found yet because it's got all these paths under this big rock. She will get us here. Uh, in Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipeg. Well just you gotta think if you think about uh, here, what was here? If, uh, whose traditional territory are we on? We're on the traditional territory of Sturgeon. We're at the bottom of the lake, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and, and of course, we all know serpents have got a bad name from the impact of the influence of Christianity and how it's been, how that's been projected onto our people, too. It's been a, a binary good and evil way of looking at the world, but you know what? That that that, bi that binary way it's also in our stories, too. There's, there's twins in these stories, one good, one evil, you know, we can't get to the cross stories too. But in a nutshell, I don't know that I like that um, certain story, and um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, that it, it's, it's a good story, but it's still, um, it's still, um, because of it's, it's, it's still un shared uncomfortable. It's one way to put it. Any more questions? You said it's Serpent Day. In what um, culture is it Serpent Day? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Canadian culture, I suppose. I just heard it on the radio on the way here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 
I'm curious about how I'm well, I'm staring at your, your treaty two medal, and I know it's treaty two just because I recognize the outline, but um, I'm just wondering about maybe um, just generally about how maybe this treaty with you know, this original treaty, how it influenced maybe Treaty 2 or number treaties or um, just the approach to treaty making? You know, that's an excellent question because that's that's the one that I've been challenged by my own dad to, to get a, a deeper understanding of what those words mean, in Akongiwan. In Akongiwan, it was described to me as a set of, uh, uh, of stories that, that become these laws. In fact, I've, I've actually heard of these stories and going back to another uh, feminine element of the storytelling that the Akazokana, those sacred stories, are female muses that sit in the, in the directions. Those female muses were the wives of Nanabuju, uh, <clears throat> Nanabuju's children, sorry, because there's four brothers. And uh, even even where those those wives came from, they came from a different star, not the same place that we came from, as where Nyanke came from. Um, Nanabushu's wife came from a different place. Those those wives also came from a different place. So you know these stories help us help me place. Um, my own role to writing, you know, my, my role to writing, Ojibwe, again, is writing, and they say Ojibwe comes from that word to be writing. And what were we writing on? We often hear we're, we're, we're all of society, and that's true, but we were writing on stuff. What were we writing on? Rock walls. So, Spirit, a long time ago, uh, recognized they were already writing on the rocks and uh, that certainly talked about it. Early Nishandamu was, was part of that teaching process and one of those teachers to, to help uh, retain that, that knowledge. And this, this story, and these, there is a set of stories that have survived on this side of the world, I'll say, that are different than the normal stories. But I love stories, you know. I, I love Watching all kinds of movies when they come out, and you see like the blending of storylines, you often hear the the rags to riches stories, or you see a lot of male uh, male oriented stories, uh, success, overcoming all these obstacles. There's very there's a limited set of storylines, but within um, within another story, for example, Bagak, there's a female perspective, there's a male perspective. There's, so there's different layers that I, I like to see within these stories. So they they help me to understand those those laws, those meaning those things. It's been difficult. So I hope that answers your question. Because you know what? It's represented in the pipe too. Because who are we speaking for? And with this, what is this? Who am I? You know, I often, I often say, I often say, and you know what, when I first said I was going to do Sasquatch for my PhD, people would laugh at me right in my face. <laughs> but they, they, part of my methodology was just to simply ask the non-human world to help me. And so that's been what I did. And so I'm at a point now where I'm working on writing these stories, and it's a, an extensive process. And uh, now I'm at a place where I've had great co-workers that are helping me to unpack this and put it into the lesson plans and we're, we're just tackling now. Uh, we're trying to take um, the science fair in a different direction. Well, who, who defines what science is? Science is defined in English as knowledge, but it depends on who's defining that knowledge because our own experiences come from active participation in our natural world. And, you know, in the city we have a hard time having real meaningful interactions with our environment. You want to go to the lake, 
they're drinking the water to be thin. The Soviet, for example, and hang on. I used to be a bouncer over there. And used to, I, I, I saw the college life was like. I mean, it's, it's, it's out of reach of most people anyway. Um, I don't have a cottage. <laughs> but um, that, that, so our indigenous rights, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights are rooted in ceremonies that are doing songs and things like that. I brought my good friend here today too because he's a, a, a great singer and uh, he, he talks about astronomy, how the Big Dipper, how the stars are the first signs. And we're going to be sharing our teachers on, on Friday because I used to always look at the Big Dipper, I think that was all I thought. I didn't know it's connected to, uh, I didn't know it's a Fisher story origin. I didn't know that there's, there's a reason why it goes around and, and uh, how the birds were a part of all that story. So there's all kinds of little stories how those animals are teachers. Any more questions? Time is it? Uh, three minutes. Come on, someone's got a question. <laughs> I, you know what? How I stumbled into this? This was very uh, mind blowing to me, actually, because at one point I thought Sabe was Sasquatch, and then, and then, and then I was corrected. I was told it's Miss Sabe. That word, like we heard in the story, is connected to those other words: Mississippi River, Big Long River, Mississauga, Mississauga, Big Lake. Um, you know, there's a lot of Winnipeg. What does Winnipeg mean? Not a lot of people know what Winnipeg means. Ween, nebe, gum, mean dirty, nebe, water. Gum is like a, a place or something. Manitoba, what does Manitoba mean? Manitoba, I think. <laughs> where spirit sits. Where did, where did that happen, you know? Our, our language is very connected to place name. History. There was a place, Manitou Bay, over at Bannock Point, and that's a real story. Not that it's a different story, uh, but that's where Tishkazit was taken from and constructed in the star world and taught these stories. You know, and, and um, you know, there was a point in my own life where I thought these stories were out of reach and were wrong and lost because but it's been the most uh, it's been the most beautiful thing for me to, to realize that Spirit loves us so much. She's always going to send those messages to people who still listen to the voice of nature through the language and the ceremonies like that. So, wish you in the book number one. Thank you for listening to it. I hope you enjoyed the inaugural <laughs> round bag series, and I uh, hope that was a good first presenter. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Pleasure talking to you guys today.